that was the first time that we sold the house and they wired, I believe it was like $365,000 into our bank account. And we had been in the house maybe five years. Mm. So that was the first time I was like, whoa, <laughs> real estate. the seven figure educator podcast. My name is Dr. Erica Jordan Thomas, CEO and founder of EJT education group, former teacher, former principal and Harvard grad on this episode of the seven figure educator podcast. I have my girl, Erica Brown with me, the real estate investor extraordinaire who is going to break down for us the real estate game. Y'all, I brought someone on the podcast who not just looks like us and is a real estate investor, but she knows her is. She has a multiple seven-figure portfolio when it comes to real estate. She has over 30 doors in her portfolio. So this is going to be a great conversation. I want you to buckle up. I want you to get out that notebook, your iPad, your Remarkable, whatever you're writing on, and take notes because you're not going to want to miss this. Let's jump in. All right. So let's have this real estate conversation. First off, thank you for being here. Thank I am so incredibly grateful to have you. I could not think of anyone better for this conversation because when I think about real estate and even my own real estate journey, it's like, I'm going to learn from somebody who looks like me and I need to learn from somebody who has receipts. Mm. So let's start with your receipts. Mm-hmm. Talk us through how many doors you have and how many states you invest in. Yes. So right now, because I'm always buying and selling right now, I have 36 doors and I own over 5 million net um, worth in real estate. That's after mortgages. That's after mortgages. (laughs) Okay, so let's break this down for the people because even my head, I'm like, okay, I don't. So, net. Okay, so explain to us what net means in the context of real estate. Absolutely. So, net, as far as the context of real estate, means how much the properties are worth versus how much I owe the bank. So, the difference in that is equity. And that equity is essentially almost like a savings account that is in my properties that I own, that that I can sell, liquidate, and then cash money is wired to my account. And so I own properties in Atlanta and also Texas. Okay. And how long have you been investing in real estate? I've been investing in real estate for the last eight years, since 20, is it 2016? Yeah. Is that eight years? That sounds about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Eight years. Okay, so 36 doors and you're constantly buying and selling. Do you know the number of total like real estate transactions that you had? Like, because obviously, because I mean, and I think what's fascinating about your real estate journey, which we're going to get into is you've flipped and you sold, you bought and hold. So do you know the total number of properties or if you had to guesstimate the total number of properties that you've purchased? Oh, that's a lot. So I probably purchased about... 40, maybe 45, 40 around there. Um, And so some I've sold and then some I flipped. So our uh, portfolio, so we do a lot of different things. Our, my range is really wide when it comes to real estate. Um, My strategy is to predominantly buy and hold, which means that we buy and we hold them for a period of time as a rental property. Um, Also, we invest in multifamily. So we have apartments as small as we have apartments. And then we also have single family homes and we have like quads and duplexes that are kind of like in between. Um, I've also built houses. I've flipped houses. I have supported with um, projects that have developed from the ground up. I, because I'm also a licensed real estate agent, I've helped clients um, represent clients in the commercial property. We own land. Um, Yeah. So I have like a, I guess a a wide range. I've, I've invested in syndications, which is basically where you, I invest as a completely passive investor. I'm an accredited investor. So mm-hmm. essentially, if you see those like big apartment complexes and they're like 400 units or whatever, I've invested in like one of those here in Atlanta. And then I'm also an angel investor. So I am an investor in a tech company and also a coffee shop. Receipts. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there's so much to unpack here. And a part of the reason why 
I wanted to have this conversation with you is because like folks always talk about real estate. And I think in particular, when people are talking about, okay, there's two ways when you study millionaires that they got their money either through a business, entrepreneurship, or through real estate. Right. And then when people are having conversations, even for myself as, you know, I now have more disposable income that I've ever had in my life, which means more tax liability yep. than I've ever had in my life. Like the strategy that continues to come up over and over and over again is real estate, mm -hmm. where some people are saying, well, spend more money and just get more expenses. It's like, nah, that can only get you so far right. where real estate is a more sophisticated tax strategy play. So we're going to get into that here in a moment of mm -hmm. the actual tax incentives related to real estate. Mm -hmm. um, but let's actually start with your very first deal. Mm -hmm. So when was it? And then walk us through the details of your first deal. Yes. I'm jumping in real quick to make sure that you know about my scorecard, which is the opportunity for you to get clear on what stage of business you're in. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I want you to go back and check out the episode that I have around the three stages of business. And I developed this scorecard so that way you can get quick clarity around A, what stage you are in business, and B, the specific action steps given that stage so that way you can execute immediately. So go ahead, scroll down to the show notes, and I want you to click the link for the Get Launch Consulting Scorecard. Take that quiz so that way you have clarity on your stage of business. Let's hop back into the episode. So I often talk about my first deal like outside of the house that I we bought, but truly my first real estate deal was my primary home because what we did was we did what we call house hacking. So we bought a property in the hood because at the time it's what we could afford and we actually wanted to live um, with black people, mm -hmm. <laughs> predominantly black neighborhood. And so we bought a house and we uh, bought a house that had a unfinished basement. And we took advantage of the, it was a, it was a, it, at this time, it was 2011, the market was super sketchy. Most people had just went through the Great Depression, had lost like a bunch of properties and things like that. So real estate was very scary at the moment, right? And so we found a property that was listed as like an auction. It had foreclosed, which is a whole other story. I, to, I definitely have to tell this story mm -hmm. on here, but um, it was foreclosed and we bought it for $20,000, mm. which is crazy. And I had to literally borrow $3,000 from my daddy to buy it. Mm -hmm. I had to basically say that, you know, it was a, it was a gift, but it was really, you know, don't, don't tap me, mm -hmm. but it was really a loan cause he didn't have it to give. <laughs> so I borrowed $3,000 and we bought our first home and we got what's called a reno a 203k renovation loan. It's essentially a federal housing renovation loan where they give you money to buy the house and to renovate it. Mm -hmm. So we bought a house that we could uh, renovate the basement so that we can rent it out. Because at the time we had two kids in childcare, I was a breadwinner um, and we were trying to like get out of this rat race of paycheck to paycheck. So it was like, can we at least get some relief and rent out our basement? Um, we rented out to someone at our church and we made some extra money. So that was truly our first investment property was a property that we actually lived in. Mm. Mm -hmm. And do y'all still own that property today? Nope, we sold it. So that's a funny, that's a good, that's a good story. So what's so interesting is that, so we bought this property and it's like maybe four properties just kind of like uh, right next to it. We learned, we later found out that this there was a there was a woman a black woman a, a grandmother to the uh the people who ended up foreclosing on it there was a grandmother who moved to the area um around the time white flight happened because this this area was actually historically white neighborhood then um black people began moving in after we began getting educated and everything after the uh during the with the adc and so a lot of people then began moving to this area so white flight took place this woman Brought, bought her house, which is a house I lived in, plus three other houses on the block. Oh, wow. Yes. And she ended up leaving these homes to her kids and her grandkids. And unfortunately, the house that I moved into, her grandkid lost it. And it ended up foreclosing. And then that's when we bought it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, and so we were able to to buy that property. And what's so crazy is that we were just moving to the area that we can afford and we wanted to live, you know, near our people. And when we ended up selling the house, we came to a place where we wanted to move to another area, another uh, same side of town, but a different area. And so we were going to build a house and we were going back and forth. Should we sell this? Should we rent it out? And when we ran the numbers, we found that it was actually more profitable for us to sell it versus keep it as a rental. We sold that house. And even though at the time we had already had maybe three rental properties that we bought over time, that was the first time that we sold the house and they wired, I believe it was like $365,000 into our bank account. And we had been in the house maybe five years. Mm. So that was the first time I was like, whoa, <laughs> real estate. Hold on, because you bought it for 20K. We bought it for 20K and we got a loan to renovate it. So we had we owed total 132000 mm. So you were, now you said you got three hundred About 365, yep. So you netted $140,000. Yeah. The power of real no, estate. No, no, no. We got 365000 into our account. We sold the house for, I think it was four sixty five something like oh. that. Oh. Yeah, so no, $365,000 was wired to our account. Oh, so that was the, the net. Was yes. The oh, okay, After the it. agent commissions. And so I was like, wait, what? Because mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. you don't, you know, you know, it's, you don't really experience it until like you actually are, you benefit from it. Right. It's like sometimes we look at equity as this like hypothetical imaginary thing until you actually get to benefit from it. And from there, we were able to buy like three or four houses plus have now a a good nest egg of money um, to keep. So Mm. it was it was definitely life changing. Mm. I feel like every like real estate investor has that story of like the first time they were like, whoa. Yeah. Like like, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. And like money can move faster through real estate. And so for me, that was, I had bought my first property in 2013 in Charlotte, North Carolina. At the time I had just became an assistant principal and don't ask me why, as a single woman, I felt I was like, like I that's needed amazing a three, that you bought a house. Don't ask me why I needed a three, four bedroom <laughs> house. And I was like, at that time, what, 25, I yeah. think? I don't know, give or take a couple of years. And I just bought a house mm-hmm. and I bought it for $150,000. So I purchased the property for $150,000 in Charlotte, North Carolina. That was a little over 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And that house has more than doubled in value. Wow. And so I remember like like randomly a couple of years ago, just pulling up what the value of the home was. And I was like, what? <laughs> yes. I was like, I didn't even do nothing to it. Right. And when I moved out of Charlotte, I put it, I had, I've been renting it ever since. And yeah. I haven't lived in Charlotte in since 2018. Yeah. And so I haven't paid the mortgage wow. <laughs> since 2018. Yeah. And so it's continuing to make it, money it's for continuing you. continuing to make money for me in yeah. both ways of the increased yeah. appreciation as well as from a cash flow standpoint. Yeah. And so that for me was my first, you know, like, oh my gosh, like, mm-hmm. let me figure out this real estate play. Mm-hmm. So that was your first deal. Mm-hmm. Walk us through the deal that you are most proud of? Oh man, that's, that's easy. Uh, so the deal I'm most proud of is my apartment complex. And, and not just because of the equity and all those things, but like the mindset, like hurdle and uh, like overcoming process that it took to get there. So at this time I had been in a place where I don't know, at the time, maybe I had owned like between 19 and 20 properties. And I felt like I was in a place where I'm like, okay, I figured this out. I've gotten a good handle on it. And I know how to acquire properties. I know how to property manage. I felt like very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to level up. I knew that I wanted to scale up. I knew that I wanted to get to this, you know, this, this, my goal cash flow amount every month. And I'm like, I got to do this easier. Now that I know what I'm doing, I know I could do it with multifamily. And so for some reason, whenever I looked at deals on the market, when I seen a million dollars, I would just get afraid. Mm. It wasn't even the fact that the property could have been worth three million. But if I seen a million, I just got afraid. Mm. Right. And so I was just and I knew that that very that that fear was holding me back. 
So what I did was I went to a conference and, you know, when you go to a conference, sometimes it can be like a fire hydrant. It's mm -hmm. like so much information. But I said, you know what? I am going to commit to learn these two things. Property management, how to scale like a larger deal, property management and creative ways to finance a, like a deal, like a larger deal. And so I committed to just focusing on learning those two things. And I did. I learned those two things and I said, OK, I have the knowledge now. The next deal I see, I am not going to just say no before running the deal. So sure. So it's one of those things where like when you, when the knowledge, when you get the knowledge, all of a sudden you see opportunities more than yeah. you did before. And so I got back home and I found this deal and I was like, oh Lord, I think this is a good deal. And I called my mentor, went to his office. We walked through the deal, ran the numbers and he was like, this is the deal. How did you find this? And so when he, when your mentor says that, right, right, you know, you own right. to something. So then we got in the car and we went down there, we walked the property and, you know, and I bought it. And I ran the numbers. I figured out how to do it. And, you know, and so it was it was huge. And, and another thing I, th I love about it, because it wasn't easy. So I went into the situation and we had one financing plan at the last minute. We had to pivot because, you know, the lenders didn't do what they said they were going to do. I had to come up with a million dollars in a month. Oh, let's talk about that. I think that's when we met. I think we, oh. I had just was like, girl, let's have this conversation. I had to come up with a million dollars in a month. So I didn't want to lose this deal. And so found the money and I ended up with so crazy. It's why relationships are really important. I had a lender that I had been working with, a private lender. And this is a very much, uh, you know, white, good old boy, Carolina situation mm -hmm. that normally we, you know, we don't have a seat at this mm -hmm. table normally. And I ended up doing this deal with them. They, they financed the deal for me. And um, it ends up being the biggest deal they've ever done. Oh, wow. With, you know, little black girl from Dallas. Come on. <laughs> Come on. So that was so for so many reasons. Me overcoming fear. Me not being afraid to, like, ask for what I wanted. Me, you know, being able to still, like, push through all those pivots and challenges and still moving forward. That absolutely is the is the, the, the best deal, the proudest I'm, I, I am of. And, and now what's crazy is that we are two years in and we've already accumulated $2 million in equity just because of, you know, how we run the business and like right, buying at the right time and just all the things. So, mm. yeah. Ooh, okay. There's so much to unpack here. This is so good. So good. Okay. So let's, Let's talk about the tax incentives related yes. to real estate. Yes. And then I want to unpack, unpack a couple of your, your thoughts related okay. to real estate. So like, what are the tax incentives? Like how can owning real estate, yes. purchasing real estate actually help you mitigate your tax liability? Yes. So this is how I like to describe it. So what are the two things that makes the U.S. economy look healthy? housing and jobs, mm -hmm. right? So when you are a corporation and you provide either housing or jobs, the government actually incentivizes you to do that. So and with as a real estate investor, when you provide housing, the tax code actually provides you almost like discounts for taking the risk to provide the housing. Mm. Um, and so there are a number of different types of discounts, but essentially it all depends on your income and all those types of things. But when you're providing housing, I have examples that I teach in my mentorship where you can actually make more money and actually, so take more money home and pay significantly less in taxes by being an investor. So a great example I have is I, I talk about when my mom, before she retired, how, when she when she was working, so she, so I probably at the time probably brought in maybe five to six times more money per year. And she paid more money in taxes than I did mm -hmm. because of what we call depreciation. Um, and so the biggest thing with real estate is depreciation, even though your, your property will up appreciate, which is gain equity over time. What happens is the government says, because you're owning this property that's now older in, in age, we're going to actually, in, the, in that property, depreciate, depreciates because it's getting older as, as it ages. We're going to give you a discount every year on your taxes because you provide housing for this. And then you have other things like bonus depreciation. So with my apartments, because I took an even bigger risk, I was able to do what's called a cost segregation study. 
And then we were able to like basically depreciate all parts of the, it's really all parts of the building, which I actually made over a million dollars last year and got a $14,000 refund. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really a game changer mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you have the right strategy, you have the right team and you, and you buy the as asset. So let me, uh, this is so good because this is, this is a part of the hidden curriculum that we don't talk about yeah. when it comes to wealth. And this is how we have situations where, because I tell my clients too, where it's like, there are some of you all who are earlier stage in business who are paying more in taxes than I am yes. because of certain tax strategies yes. that now become unlocked when yes. you either reach either certain levels in business, but also when you're actually strategic with certain assets. Because yes. again, the, the only tax strategy that exists is more than, or the tax strategy that exists, it's bigger than just, will spin down yes. or buy a G-Wagon. Yes. Like there's, there's more to tax strategy yes. than both of those. So just to make this plain for folks, because what you're saying is that, okay, at the end of the year, if I have made a million dollars in my business and through and first off, we're not tax professionals. So like yes. do your own due diligence. Build your team. And build your team. <laughs> and for the sake of this example, and we're going to share, do an experience share mm -hmm. where let's say we had a million dollar business and you know, when it comes down to our own personal situation, we had $250,000 of taxable income. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that when we have real estate, real estate is an asset that which the government is giving us an incentive and saying, we're gonna give you tax breaks to where you can reduce that 250,000 by certain amounts. Yes. You can also write off different parts of your real estate assets, whether it's actual expenses. So I know that when I had a change in tenant in my Charlotte house mm -hmm. and they did, they left my house a mess mm -hmm. and it took me, I had to pay $10,000 to actually get it ready for the next tenant, but I was able to write that off Yes, because that's an expense associated to the property. So yes. if I had $250,000 of taxable income, now I'm writing off $10,000. Yes. And what you're saying with the, the cost segregation study is that now there's different pieces of the building that I can depreciate a faster. Th a, a faster. Yeah. So it could be at a five year rate, a 10 year rate, whatever. Yeah. But this is why having a financial team is so important. Yes, because I don't know how to do that. We don't, right. Hire someone to do that. Right. That's all that they do. And, but that's how someone who started off with $250,000 of taxable income yeah. can now get zero or get a refund. And do you know why they want to do that? Why? The reason why they want you not to pay a bunch of taxes because they want you to make more money so that you continue to invest. Because if you continue to invest, then you continue to provide housing and that continues to make the U.S. economy stable. Mm. So I'm like, this is why, and I appreciate you naming the story of like, I was so afraid to invest bigger, but when you invested bigger, now, like you have all of these incentives yes. and, and like, I think that is a great example yeah. of like the wealth building journey where it's like the bigger you can play the action, like we live in a country that actually will incentivize those big plays. Yes. And so they feel really risky on the surface, yeah. but like when you can tap into it, you can execute it. Yeah. You actually are better off for it, and it, right. you're actually in a position to where you can continue to help make your money grow. Right. Um, okay. So, you something that's really unique about you is because there are some people who are real estate investors, and they have one strategy. Mm -hmm. You exercise multiple strategies, mm -hmm. which I find to be so fascinating because I know I'm a buy and hold girl. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know this about, I, I am not interested in no flip. I don't want to flip nothing. I manage no contractor. Yeah. I am a buy and hold and I will get me a property manager. Yes. Okay. Because I'm not managing yes. nothing. Yes. And so I think it's interesting that you have such diverse experience in multiple real estate strategies. So how do you determine what real estate strategy play you're going to pull? That's so good. That's a great question. And that's a question that so many people have. And not knowing that question actually prevents people from starting. Mm -hmm. So that's really mm -hmm. good. So a couple things that to me are like two primary factors that I determine like what I do next. One 
at the time, what do I need? Do I need more cash flow on the monthly basis or am I good on cash flow? I'm more future focused where I'm focusing on like retirement and like appreciation. So I say, am I right now a cash flow uh, investor or appreciation investor? And note that I say it right now right. because they can change right. and they have changed for me. And then secondly, I look at like how I'm feeling right now in the season of my life. How much margin do I have? Do I have time, extra time that I want to be more active? And so because I'm more active, I'm more cash flow focused. Or do I have, do I not have that time? And I kind of wanted to, it, it's, it's more important for me to just move with ease and more predictable. That's, the, you know, the more appreciation investor. So I, I do think it depends on those two things. I, I see people all the time that they watch HGTV and they follow all these people on Instagram and they want to do all these big renovations and do all of this, but they don't have the time. You know, they're right. traveling all over, whatever the situation is. And so I always tell them, like, don't have FOMO. Like, there's a time and a season. And just because you want to have a vacation home and you want to flip properties today, but that doesn't align with your life, just get started. Begin like investing, begin like find your quick win, what's easy for you, what is, you know, uh, possible for you start. Mm -hmm. And then over time, you, as you increase your knowledge, you will be comfortable with taking more risk. And then as your seasons change, you can get into more of those active investing type of strategies. Um, so I actually started off super active investing and now I'm in the season where it's like, I just want to collect checks. Right. Come on. I just want to collect mm -hmm. checks every month. Mm -hmm. Predictable. Mm -hmm. In the inbox. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, actually what's so interesting, like maybe two years ago before the market shift, I began um, pivoting most of my properties from Airbnb to Section 8. Mm -hmm. And I love Section 8 too because I'm very much a purpose-driven investor and most of my tenants are single moms. And so I get to really, I really get to provide a really good product to single moms and, and people who are just like less likely that people like consider. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Um, and then now, yeah, I just, I just collect checks and it's really nice. And I hired a property management company and that's all I do. And I want a t-shirt. The, the world to live checks. my life. <laughs> That's the t shirt I want. I just collect checks. I just collect checks. That part. Okay. Every month. A black woman deserve to, I just want to collect checks. That part. Okay. Recession proof. That the government, part. you know, Section 8, they're going to always pay. So that's that's what I'm on mm. in this season. Is it possible for a, if from your perspective, mm -hmm. that a property that's not currently cash flowing to still be a good deal? Yes. As long as it's taken care of its expenses. And if it's in an area that is growing in value, then it could be a good deal. So for the appreciation investor who that aligns with, you know, you guys are more concerned with future financial options. Like I mentioned, like when I sold my house and I made all that money, right? Sometimes most people who are high earning people and really enjoy what, they are, what they're doing, they're not necessarily trying to like retire to replace their income. They just want to create future financial options later. And so for the person who that applies to, being able to pick up a few rental properties here and there in areas that are strategically growing in value, once life change or if life changes and you want to do something else, now you have this nest egg of equity where you can decide, I'm going to tap into this, I want to sell this property, whatever, you have financial options. When you're broke, you don't have financial options. You have to do what is given to you versus being able to decide what you want to do next. Mm. Okay, so let's let's go through a couple of real estate terms and I okay. want you to break them down okay. and define them for us. Okay. What is considered a second home? Oh, that's good. So a second home is a property that you don't live in primarily, but maybe it's a property that you vacation to sometimes and you also rent out sometimes. We consider that a second home or a vacation home loan. And can I talk about the product? I love it. I love second yeah, homes. Okay, okay, go ahead. So I have a second home loan. So I have a cabin. Um, we we moved to Georgia and we fell in love with like the country and the cabin. So we started 
uh, going to cabins and all that kind of stuff. And eventually we bought our own. And so I was able to take advantage of what's called a second home loan or vacation home loan. The requirement is that you have to live, It has the house has to be 60 miles from where you live and you have to- 60 plus miles? 60 miles. So if it has to be 60 miles away at minimum. Okay, got it. So it could be more, um, but it has to be at least- You can't buy it on the same block. No, but. can't buy it on the same block. It has to be at least 60 miles away. And then the beautiful thing about the vacation home loan or second home loan option is that you get the same interest rates with the sec, at least as of today, 2024, you get the same interest rates as you do with a primary home loan. So in 2021, when rates were really low, when my other investment properties, I was getting like five and a quarter percent with my vacation home loan, I got 3%, mm -hmm. which was great because it lowered my mortgage payment. And so I just had to commit to uh, vacationing there or going there for two weeks out the year. And outside of that, I could rent it out on Airbnb or whatever I wanted to rent it out on. So you said another term of vacation home. Yes. So what's, are they similar or are they different of a second home versus a vacation home? It's in, we use the word interchangeable. So um, when you go to a mortgage lender, they're going to either, it's going to either say second home loan or vacation home loan. So it could be, it could be used either way. Mm. What is a DSCR? Mm. What is that? Okay. So DSCR, it stands for debt service coverage ratio. And it is a loan that is for rental properties. It's, it is a commercial type of loan that is for rental properties. And so the way I describe DSCR loans is that the property, you qualify for the property not based on your personal income. So like when you go to get a Fannie Mae or conventional loan, they're going to qualify you based on what we call your debt to income or how much you make versus how much the property is, the mortgage payment is. DSCR is not like that. We call that an asset-based loan. So the loan is actually based on how much the property makes an in income. Um, they do factor in your credit score, but besides that, the qualification process is based upon the deal that you find. So if if you learn from me, I'm going to teach you how to run numbers based off of um, what we call a 70% rule. So I want you to buy a property uh, 70, 70 to 80% worth um, what the property is. Either you need the, Either that means you need to get the house at a discount, or that means you need to put 20 to 30% down. And if you stick within those numbers and you're able to, you know, uh, make in rental income to pay for all of your expenses, then you essentially will be able to get qualified for a DSCR loan. Mm. What's a hard money lender? A hard money lender. Oh, I love this. First of all, this reminds me of my biweekly office hours. <laughs> I, I always leave my biweekly office hours so excited because I just, just like just spitfire. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so a hard money loan is a short term construction loan for investors. Um, generally people say, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of hard money loans because the rates are higher. The rates are typically between 10 to 15%, um, interest only payments. So, which means that if you were to buy a house, you see it's mostly in like flips. Mm -hmm. So they will, um, the hard money lender will give you money to buy the house. And then they will also give you money to renovate the house. And then your monthly payments, um, as you are, as you have the mortgage will be interest only. So that means that you are not paying any money towards the principal. So when we use hard money loans, our goal is to get in and get out. Mm -hmm. It is general, it is a short term construction loan um, type of product for investors. So yeah, hard money loans. Okay, and then what's an ADU? Ooh, I love ADUs. Um, ADU stands for Accessory Dwelling Units. Um, and so essentially ADUs are additional uh, units that are on your home. They can be attached to your home or they can be unattached. I can give you some examples. So I have a garage, I have an apartment um, over my garage. That's considered an ADU. Tiny houses, granny flats, um, those are all considered ADUs as well. So those are ways that you can actually make additional income um, off of your property. So I love them. I, I don't like to ever pay the mortgage on my own. So, <laughs> and that's, a, that's actually a common thing that people don't like realize is that uh, you could be a, what we call house hacker, where you rent out a portion of your home that you live in, 
whether you are single, whether you're married, I'm I'm married with three kids and two dogs, and I still have an ADU. So that's a common myth that I want people to like. And and, and nobody's in my space. Like they have their space, I have my space. They pay half the mortgage with their um, with their rent, and we're good. So, mm. so you just said essentially like a rule that you have of like I am essentially not the one who's only going to be paying my mortgage. Like every mortgage yes. I got, somebody somebody put some on somebody it. putting <laughs> some on it. Whether yes. it's fifty, whether it's a hundred, yes. or little, all these cash flow, it's somebody putting some on it. Yeah. What are other rules that you have when it comes to investing in real estate? That's good. I. I personally, I'm, I'm learning through this, but I personally don't like to pay full price for properties. <laughs> so even I've had to, like my mentor challenged me, he's like, well, your primary home is a little different. I'm like, mm. I really like to, I like to buy properties where I'm able to actually have equity when I go into it. And that's my like conservative way of, of investing. Um, I'm actually not like a big, like, oh, risk taker. Like I, I invest in what I understand. And what I love about real estate is that like, if I'm able to get the property under market value with some type of negotiation strategy, or maybe I buy the property and I put a little bit, like maybe it doesn't, it needs work and I put a little bit of work into it. Like I like that. So I actually, most people, when they look at real estate and they're like on Zillow or whatever, they're looking at the houses that have all the bells and whistles right. like this one. I actually like the ones with the bad pictures. Like I love the ones with the bad pictures because that means that I can go into it and put a little bit of work into it and be able to buy it with equity already in place. So that if something happens really quick and I need to sell it or need to leverage it for something, I have those options pretty quickly. Mm. For someone who's like, okay, I'm I'm ready to get into the real estate game. Yep. I want to take that leap. What would be advice that you would give them on just where to start? Well, that's a good question. I would say they need to start with knowledge because a lot of times their fear is creeping up because they don't understand that they don't have the knowledge. And when you're first starting out, knowledge gives you that ability to like be to grow your confidence so i would start out um if you're a black and brown person then you can start out with following me <laughs> i share lots of resources but a course or attending a conference if courses aren't your thing attending a conference um being able to get in the room with some other real estate investors that in some type of format where you're able to learn i think that is the first start podcast um a book that increasing your knowledge is the first start. Once you increase your knowledge, and we have some people who are on the other end of the spectrum, they are book conference knowledge like freaks, but then they don't do anything. And then they're like, well, what do I need to do? I'm like, you need the experience. There's not another piece of information that's going to give you the confidence, the confidence to take, to take action experience is what's going to actually quiet those fears over time. So I would say with those people who are in that same lane, if you're, you have the knowledge, you need to get the experience, which means you need to take action. You may need some support, accountability to kind of get started. And for the pe person who's starting from square one, you need the knowledge. I, um, there was a real estate conference that I went to because of you. Uh, you were speaking at it. And that was my first time being in a space with all real estate investors and I had this aha that I don't know why I hadn't had before. I'm like, oh, this is a business. Yes. Like, even if you are not a full-time real estate investor, like you still have to treat it like a business. Yes. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is they're not even treating it like a side hustle. They're treating it like a hobby. And yes. because they're treating it like a hobby versus you actually have to structure this like a, an additional business. Yes. Then I think, I think that's what creates bottlenecks and stumbling blocks and yes. all these things that people are experiencing because they're approaching it as if they're going to the movies or you going to concerts or like, oh, I'm going to just go buy another property. It's like, no, you're creating yeah. a whole nother business. And what I appreciate and value about you so much is the point in which we had met, I had gotten to the point exactly where you said, where it's like, I had consumed as much as I could, where I'm like, the only way for me to take this to the next level in my real estate investing journey is I have just got to get a deal. Yeah, <laughs> like, yes. like I have just got to go through the experience. Yeah. And since we have been in relationship, I have 
I'm trying to remember if I bought my DC property before. It might have been it right was when we right met. Right when you, we met. Yep. So since since we've met, I've purchased two additional properties. Even with my Charlotte property that I already had, you taught me how to assess market rents. Mm -hmm. And my property manager was actually recommending a rent that was below market. Mm -hmm. And so because you taught me how to assess market rents, I was able to tell them what they should be charging per month would actually position me to cash flow an additional two to three hundred dollars per that. month. Right. And so I, I say that because I, I feel like I've learned the most in this real estate journey with the same approach in my own business of like, you just got to take action. Yes. And I've learned the most through a, those deals. I've had deals that fell out of contract mm -hmm. and I still learned where yes, I'm they like, needed to fall out of contract. They need it. Cause I'm like, yeah. I didn't know why dipping floors were an issue yep. <laughs> until yep. I had an inspection yes. with dipping floors. And I'm yes. like, Oh, that's a foundation issue. Yes. That means this house is about to fall over. Yes. Like this, that ain't it. Yeah, right. Nope. And so I, those are just certain things to your point where it's like, it's built so much confidence in me where it's like now, you know, I don't. And I think that's the, the thing that I'm learning at this stage of business where I, even though I'm not the expert in anything, it is actually to me now feels like a liability for someone to know more about a personal asset mm -hmm. or my business more than I do. Mm -hmm. So how do you know more about my loan documents than I do? Ooh. Even if you're the lender, I yeah. need to know what this say. Right, right. Like I need to know the fact that you actually just misquoted the home insurance. Yes. So actually this monthly mortgage payment is not accurate. And because so what's going to happen at the end of the day? Who going who gonna <laughs> have to pay that at the end of the day? You. Right. 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 So that's why you can't necessarily just depend on a real estate agent or a property manager. You have to understand what you need to run your business. Right. That's exactly why that's important. And for for um, unfortunately for us, especially given the Great Recession, I've seen so many black and brown people because I, I actually came into the industry during that time. And I've seen people that were taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand and know the process so we know what is happening. We know what to ask for. We know what doesn't look right. Right, right. Yeah. How can people reach out to you, learn more about you, your work, and what you do? Yeah, so you can follow me on Erica Brown Investor on Instagram, all the things. Also, you can follow my podcast on Wealth Within Reach, and it's on all the podcast channels. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm super excited for our listeners to have had this opportunity to have this conversation. And even more importantly, that they're able to learn from someone who looks like them, mm -hmm. because I think real estate, similar to entrepreneurship, has a face yes. that oftentimes does not include us. And so to have this conversation to center an expert who looks like our audience to mm -hmm. me is really important. So thank you thank for you taking for the time me. to join us. Thank you. Thank you.